Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Unity Spiritual Center of Panama City. And a shout out to our online community. So nice to have you with us. We are embarking on our final weeks of our 12 Power series. We have gone through 10 of the 12 Powers so far. So release and life are yet to be explored. And our focus on the study of 12 Powers comes from the book 12 Powers of Man written by Charles Fillmore in 19... Yes, co-founder of Unity. See, I know that you guys know that. I'm so grateful. You have no idea. <laughs> and so our intention in studying the 12 powers is to have an idea for ourselves and for our daily living of how each one of these powers that we were born with can be utilized in our daily living. By the end of this series, you will have a greater depth and knowledge of what each power looks like when it's balanced, when it's over the top, and when it's a little underbalanced as well, because all of that is a part of our human spiritual expression. Last week, we explored zeal. We had a lot of fun with zeal, and we loved that power of zeal. Zeal is the ability to be enthusiastic and passionate as well as to inspire and motivate ourself. The color was orange and it was fascinating to see all of the creation of orange out in the sanctuary here. The metaphysical meaning of zeal is intensity, passion, Enthusiasm, it is the inward fire of the soul that urges mankind forward. Regardless of the thoughts of the intellect, of caution, or conservatism. So zeal is the <coughs> mighty force that incites the winds and the tides and the storms and it urges the planet onward in its course around all of the other planets. It is the energy within the ant that has the ability to carry the big crumb across the driveway. We've all witnessed that with amazement. How can they do that? Where does that energy come from? Or a mother who must save their child. And this little petite woman all of a sudden has the strength of a 300 pound weightlifter. Where did they get that energy, that power? It is zeal that generates that spiritual motivation for living and creating of good no matter where we are or what we are doing. It sometimes appears on the outer as interest and enthusiasm and exuberance, and yet zeal is also that driving force, the passion within your soul that can be silent, quiet. It is the energy cell within. You don't need to have an outer exuberance to sense the energy within. Regardless of how it shows up in a quiet, calm nature or in exuberance, that passion will command you to go forward in some way. The opposite of zeal is looking backward, clinging to the past, what was known, because somehow what is in our future may be uncomfortable causing us to be anxious and in fear. Someone asked me last week, during the week, what was that uh, F statement you said? False evidence appearing real is a very common way to explain fear. Here's another one. Forgetting everything is all right. Forgetting everything is all right. We fall to fear when we forget 
How many of you have forgotten? Multiple times in your life, yeah. I knew I was not alone. So zeal, that very passion and fire in our soul can be the quiet inner drive that keeps us moving towards our goals so that we can have our commitment to obtaining our life purpose. It takes a long time to figure out what that purpose is and then to stay the course. You must have zeal. So every week I have given you homework <laughs> to be mindful in your weekly activities and to observe your life, your thoughts, and ask yourself, how have I utilized the power of zeal this week? Did you use your inner zeal as quiet inspiration or loud exuberance? Only you know, and maybe your friends and fellow. <laughs> Did you acknowledge the innate divine energy within you as zeal? Because we know that zeal also activated all the powers to work together. Or did you consider the thought of zeal while sitting in your favorite chair, looking at all the unfinished projects and contemplating the state of the garage from the comfort of your chair? Hmm. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. There's. It would take zeal to do that, but not today. <laughs> We've all had those days. So each and every week you get the opportunity to be mindful and examine your life. How is this ability or attribute living out and expressing who I am being? Today, you're going to love this one. Today we explore elimination. Elimination is the ability to release, remove, denounce, deny, say no, and to let go. Mm hmm Yes. Our modern uh, terms are release and elimination. However, when Charles Fillmore, co-founder of Unity, ah, gotcha on that one, wrote the book in 1930, the term that he used was renunciation. Renunciation was the term that he used for this spiritual faculty or ability. Now, that's not a common day word. So let me tell you what the dictionary says is the definition of that term. It means a formal rejection of something, typically a belief, a claim, or a course of action. So the metaphysical meaning of renunciation from Charles Fillmore says, hmm, yeah, you guys are on it. The metaphysical meaning of renunciation is a letting go of old thoughts in order that new thoughts can find a place in consciousness. A healthy state of mind is attained when the thinker willingly lets go. I'll repeat that part willingly lets go of the old thoughts and takes on the new. The center of renunciation, currently referred to as elimination or release, is in the lower part of the abdomen, which carries forward the work of elimination of error thoughts from the mind and waste from the body. See, there's a lot more going on than you originally thought. It is cleansing error thoughts as well. So for us in our everyday activities, in order for us to say yes to something, we must also be able to say no. No is usually one of the first five words that a toddler learns. Have you ever witnessed a toddler? Learning the power of no? Oh, 
Jay is back there laughing. She's dealing with it right now. So at some point in what um, Miguel Ruiz, Don Miguel Ruiz calls the domestication process of human beings, we, we forget the power of our no. And at some point we, we learn to do what others expect, sometimes to people please or to do things out of obligation and duty. Even the word duty is like, oh my God, it's heavy, you know? So we do things because of an obligation. We've made a commitment, we didn't really wanna do it, but somehow we said yes, and so we're having to, to do that anyway. Could be part of our job or a role that we've taken on in, in society or in a group. The important thing here that we're to be mindful of because it was a domestication process, the important thing here is to recognize that when we gave the power of our no away, we tended to stop thinking why. Why were we choosing to say no in the first place? Because we stopped choosing to use the power of our no. We chose that. Everything is a choice. And sometimes attached to that behavior and giving of our power away, we sometimes also stopped thinking. This eventually led to the habitual behavior of what we call disconnection. So if you're feeling disconnected some days, claim the power of your yes and no as you breathe in to reconnect with the divine. That's not a habitual thing for New Thought people because in unity and New Thought, having that philosophy be a philosophy of mind action and consciousness, it requires that we never give up thinking. That's why we're one of the smaller denominations, New Thought, because it requires you to think and be mindful and pay attention all the time, even on vacation. <laughs> What's the point? So we're gonna practice an exercise here that's important to, to have the power of our no. To use elimination and release, to let go of our old behaviors, our old beliefs, our embedded theology that we were raised in, any aspects of our ego-based personality that hinder us from being the best person, the best Christ presence we can be, we need to practice the power of our no. So, think of something that you know you should, I don't should people often, but right now I'm gonna should you. Think of something that you know you should say no to. Oh yes, your faces are, you got it. Okay, so we're just gonna tell ourselves no. Ready? No. no. Okay, it's the hip action that adds to the, all right, so we're gonna shout it out loud one more time with gusto. Think about that thing that you know you should say no to, ready? No. no. Oh, you sound like our toddlers down the hall. <laughs> Good. So it's a lot easier to say no to something when we know, K-N-O-W, what we really want to draw into our life experience. So for example, if you used, say, a second piece of cake for the thing that you were visualizing that you should say no to, then you, K-N-O-W, what it is you really want, like maybe a trimmer waistline, or to fit in that 
pair of jeans in your closet that is just sitting there waiting for the day. Or if you, say, have a tendency to shop beyond your monthly budget, then you get to say no to that because you K-N-O-W that your goal, your intention, your desire is to have zero debt. Do you see how you got to flip the coin in order to really use the power of your no? So we're going to say, take that same example that you had, whatever you said no to, and you're going to K-N-O-W what you want on the flip side of that coin. So see that ideal K-N-O-W item and visualize it in your mind. And we're going to say together, I know what I want. Ready? I, I know, know what, what I, I want. want. Oh, once more with enthusiasm. I, I know, know what, what I, I want. want. Yes. When you turn your N-O into K-N-O-W, it's much easier to go through the process of elimination, release, and renunciation. Is that helpful? All right. No. So, another key point is that once you know what it is you want to release and identify what exactly is it that is blocking the way, visualize big cement heavy blocks that build buildings, those are the blocks that block our good. We each have those. <clears throat> sometimes we carry them in a backpack, sometimes a suitcase, sometimes a wheelbarrow. But we are all carrying some block that we must release, eliminate, and let go. I have a quote that's hanging on my refrigerator and probably has hung on our refrigerator for, I don't know, 15 years maybe. It says, the only requirements to get exactly what you want is to, one, know exactly what you want, and two, be willing to pay the price. When we practice the attribute and ability of elimination, release, and renunciation, it feels as if there's some suffering involved. But if you can hold what you K-N-O-W and work toward that, then the perception of suffering also falls away. So our scripture for today, this particular parable, shows up in three out of the four Gospels. And I wanted to use a different one. And three times, Spirit led me back to the same one. And I'm like, okay, well, if it's in the Bible three times, well, I guess it's, it, there has to be a lot more value to this parable than meets the eye. So, and I'm sure you're all sitting there thinking, oh my God, what is she gonna do with us now? Jesus told this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and then the patch from the new garment will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and the new wine will run out, and the wineskin will be ruined. I'm sure you're sitting there asking yourself, why is this idea important to me today? <laughs> and I'm going to tell you. Because I myself have a stainless steel carrier for both my tea and my water, and they go everywhere with me. So why would I be concerned with wineskins? It's because, oh, I won't get ahead of myself. The new cloth in that beginning of that parable. Whenever we buy something new, we know that it's probably going to shrink a little bit. Hence, avoid the second piece of cake. 
There's more value to that tidbit than meets the eye. Just like Jesus' parables. So anyway, a new cloth will shrink. And if you take a new cloth and patch an old garment, not only have you ruined the new garment, but the patch that has not yet shrunk will stretch itself on the old garment and tear. So not only have you ruined one new garment, you've ruined the second old garment as well. Also, regarding the wineskins, when the wineskin has already been stretched to the limit by the fermentation process of the new wine, that is the natural process there, it expanded to <coughs> capacity. And when the old wineskin has already stretched as far as it could go to put new wine that has not yet gone through the fermentation and expansion process into it would force it to expand beyond its capacity like a balloon and it would burst. You follow? Yeah. Here's the zinger. <laughs> when we compare the wineskin to our mind, to our consciousness, we know that we cannot put in a new spiritual idea into an old level of consciousness. That's why it's important to us today. When we do that, our goat skin of our mind becomes a, an I'm lost for words. The, it becomes something that will also burst in its own way. So we call that in New Thought the process of chemicalization. Chemicalization is when you try to introduce a new idea when all your foundational beliefs are saying, oh no, that can't possibly be true. But the new idea is going, yes, yes, yes. It's like trying to hold a beach ball under the water. It will not release its power, its zeal, its intensity. And in the mind, you have chemicalization, you have conflict, you have one level of your old religion or philosophy or belief saying, this is true, and the other new <coughs> thought idea saying, oh no, this is true. Has anyone here had this experience? Am I the only one? No, I didn't think so. It's called chaos, mental chaos. When you allow for the release of the old ideas in order to make room for the new ideas, it's a more peaceful process. We use the attribute of order to lessen or eliminate the internal chaos that goes on in our mind. The use of affirmations and denials, 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 saying no, that thought, belief, old way of thinking does not serve me anymore, with then an affirmation of our truth, our new belief, our new idea and concept that we want to allow in, it helps pave the way to keep the energy balanced. You want an even exchange of energy going on. You can't just add more new thoughts into the already full brain of ideas and beliefs because your brain will burst like a wineskin. Now, I'm seeing some confused faces and I'm seeing some that is like, oh my God, I've lived that. <laughs> I know exactly what she's talking about. So when you put yourself into the historical timeline of the teachings of Jesus, and his ministry here on earth, and you consider for a moment 
the radical ideas that he was trying to teach the people through parable, through story, through allegory. We are able to recognize this man was before his time. Even 2,000 some odd years later, we struggle with recognizing the hidden inner wisdom of his concepts. So when he was teaching the Jews and the Gentiles these new ideas, he taught that they could not hold on to the ideas of what they already thought they believed and put on a patch of new fabric onto an old garment and to put unfermented wine into an old wineskin. Because the teachings of Jesus would turn everything inside out and upside down for them. Have you not recognized that on your own spiritual journey? I don't think anyone in this room was raised in new thought philosophy. And when we compare what we think and teach and believe and aspire to following the teachings of Jesus to our traditional Christian cousins, has it not turned your thinking inside out and upside down on your spiritual journey? Yeah. It's fascinating. But to fully grasp what he taught which we know today and refer to as universal consciousness, the experience of our oneness with God, what, what he called the Father, when we experience that oneness, we need a new wineskin. We need a new container in which to store all of this new, exciting, creative, energized information and how it will affect our life. What they needed, what a fresh wineskin represents is an open mind, a new container. When we apply these concepts to our own meditation time, I want you to remember this quote by Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh who said, the practice of meditation helps us to release the tension within the body, within the mind, and within the emotions so that a healing can take place. Mind, body, and emotions. We must release the old in order for a healing to take place. So in our own personal meditation time, focusing on the energy center and the color of brown, the energy center being located in the lower abdominal region, we tune ourselves to the power of renunciation, elimination, or release. Having connected to this truth, we can finally come to a place where we can release our BS, belief systems. <laughs> ah, I almost got you there, didn't I? We can let go of our old belief systems that no longer are in alignment with who we know ourselves to be. And we can release and let go. Because we have learned and recognized that the truth of our nature is divine. Human beings have the spark of divinity within them, the Christ presence. Unity principle number two. And so through our lower abdomen, we release the toxicity of our mind, our emotions, and our physical body temple by deliberately empowering the mind power of release to eliminate 
thoughts and ideas of possessiveness, old injury, old hurts, any instabilities that we have experienced along the journey, we have the ability to let them go. They no longer serve who we are and who we aspire to be, a spiritual being having a human experience. We allow it to dissipate. So our balanced attribute of elimination is the ability to release, remove, deny, and let go based on our knowledge and understanding of divine law, universal law, truth, and principle. Elimination has the ability to inspire the other attributes and to help us balance all of our other 12 powers. If our elimination attribute is underdeveloped, it shows up as a person who has a hard time getting rid of anything. Clutter is something that they deal with because they have a challenge making the decision to release and to let go. And that can also apply to the clutter in our mind. When we hold tight to hurts and injustices, grudges, and the pain of the past. Sometimes it would also show up as a difficulty in getting rid of toxic friendships. We have all had people in our lives who have not supported us or empowered us or themselves for that matter to live a healthy life experience. And you have the ability to stand in your power and say no. Yes, exactly. When you use your N-O to K-N-O-W, what is the highest and best for you, we release. There is no guilt in unity teachings. So as you release, whether it's an outsized t-shirt or pair of jeans or a relationship that no longer serves you, you bless it, you thank it for serving you as it did and hold no guilt for releasing it on its continued journey. That is important. So if the elimination attribute is overdeveloped, this individual might come off as making rash and impulsive decisions about what should be eliminated. It's easier to clean someone else's garage when you have no attachment to what's in there, right? But the person who has those things might perceive like, oh my God, there it goes. And, and your friends say, ah, you don't need that, just get rid of it. Sometimes we need those people in our lives. So they may appear rash and impulsive or they may come off as being wasteful. Many of us are old enough to have people in our lives who were raised in the Depression era or came from a family that experienced lack as one of their belief systems. And they have a harder time getting rid of a six inch piece of string their elimination attribute is a little bit underdeveloped and we understand why. So they also could be the ones who prematurely discard friendships, relationships, jobs, cars, houses. It shows up in all areas 
of your life. Oh, legal documents, that's another one that you should not get rid of quite so soon. There's guidelines for that. It's good to know what they are. And so the question for us this week, your homework is, what is the attribute of elimination for me? How am I using this spiritual mind power in my life? Am I using the gift of elimination to refrain from irritated, critical reactions? Ooh, that's a doozy, isn't it? Critical, reactionary decisions? That's one thing that we could all refrain from. Do I recognize the use of elimination effectively? Am I utilizing wisdom and judgment as I discern what I should or should not release and how quickly I should do it? Do I use the attribute of elimination to remove the blocks that hinder my continued spiritual growth? Yeah, that's a good one too. So whether elimination in your life experience is balanced, over the top, or underdeveloped, we can all use our spiritual tools of denial and affirmation to rebalance ourselves, to come into a place of alignment with who we have come here to be. And so, as you ask yourself this week, how am I using my spiritual attribute of release? What can I let go and give to God. And then use your zeal <laughs> and do it right away. Don't hesitate. And I look forward to seeing some of you on Wednesday evening as we discuss this topic further at Wednesday Exploration. And until then, namaste.